We have one more keynote today, and uh, that is Catherine McGarvey. And she's just arrived backstage and is arriving on stage right now. Great, there we are. All right, thank you so much for joining us for our uh, keynote today. And uh, Catherine is with uh, VMware, who's one of our very generous sponsors. And I will now get out of your way and let you speak with us. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rich. Um, hi, everybody. Um, if you are just joining, I'm going to really um, plug Kim Huang's speech. I'm talking about inequity and the importance of addressing that within our communities and within our companies. Um, I think that was really, really great. Great. Well done, Kim. I um, highly encourage you to watch it. So I'm going to be speaking on a parallel topic, but a little bit different, talking about fostering strong open source communities that benefit all of us. So firstly, I'm a VP of engineering at VMware. I'm part of uh, Team Tanzu. So I focus on all of the developer facing products as part of the Tanzu portfolio. Um, I love that that's my scope because that's my, where my heart and my passion is as a developer myself. And that's my Twitter handle if you're interested. So I wanted to start and so to give you a bit of my background and why I value open source and sort of how I came across it. So I've been doing software development for just over 15 years. Um, I started off in C, C++, doing sound and audio codecs, um, developing apps back in the day when that was the, the most common way to do software development. I'm um, really focused on Windows apps and Linux apps as part of doing that. I then started to get into Python. And this is where I really first encountered any open source in the, in the sense of the word we're using today. Um, and that was in using the Django library. I did a lot of .NET in that time as well and some transaction SQL and really focused on GIS services. So a lot of mapping work um, in that role. I then sort of switched languages again and, and really looked into Ruby on Rails, um, a whole bunch of JavaScript frameworks uh, they seem to be sort of growing every day back when I was doing that work. Uh, Node.js, Backbone, React, and Objective Query Language. And I was mostly focused on websites. So I sort of changed the scope and changed the language at the same time. And then I've had uh, two children. And so my maternity leave for my first child, I, I learned some Spring and my second learned some Swift and also sort of spent a bit of time playing around with Kubernetes. I'm sharing that background because I wanted to really start on, on the why. I find talking about the why we invest in something or why we spend time on it is really important because it hones in on the importance of the actions you take outside of that why. So I told you my background because I want to talk about where I first encountered the, the negatives of not working in the open source community. That first job I had um, straight out of college doing C and C++, we had set it up so that it was a C++ development shop. And back in that time period, it was a real focus on how large your executable was because everyone was downloading at internet speeds were not what they were. And we were worried that customers would move away from using our products if it, took too, too, it was too large a download, um, either with internet speed, et cetera. This was back in Australia and Australia's infrastructure at that time uh, wasn't great. So, um, something else that was impacting that. So the founder of this small startup that I worked at, it was about 20 people, um, decided because of download size not to use the standard template library with C++. So as a result, um, internally we as a group spent a lot of time rewriting the basic things in a sort of a common internal private library. Um, so this is everything from sound card drivers, which maybe is better in C anyway, uh, to uh, basic networking and uh, string interaction. And so one day I found myself writing a float to a string conversion. Now it was a wrapper on another method. And it occurred to me, I was gaining all of this knowledge all in an area 
that wouldn't matter. It wouldn't extend beyond that current job and that current role that I had. And so it was really limiting me to spend all this time investing in this common library that I just couldn't apply elsewhere. It's not like I would take that onto that next job. So this for me really speaks to the benefit. It's much more extensible than private repos. Now that may sound simplistic to you, but for me, as I thought about gaining a knowledge and learning something, um, having it so limited to one current job really limited my outlook. The second thing I'll share that I find really valuable is opportunity to learn from other people's code. If you've been around the um, software development library, uh, software development community for some time, and you've been working on a project for some time, you may have encountered this experience, um, that moment where you do a git blame, you know, you're on a shared project with other people and you see your own name. It's, uh, it's wonderful in some ways in that you know you've grown since writing that code and you can see your own progress, that fast feedback is it exists. Um, but how much nicer is it to learn from other people's code? It's faster um, and you maybe not have that cringe-worthy moment when you realize the mistake you might have made. And then this, this third one kind of feels very self-explanatory. I've sort of seen this come out. Um, when you do uh, code reviews or paired programming, where you get someone else's input and immediately you're like, oh, that is such a, a much better idea. And this benefit of doing things out in the open this way means that the code design is just going to become better or there's more opportunity for it to become better. So I share the why. I now want to share the what you should measure. And then I'm going to spend a bit of time on a couple of things here. So the health metrics for growth. The first thing that's really interesting um, as we talk about health metrics is the governance model. And I know within Apache, that's kind of fairly uh, standard. Uh, in other communities, that can be really different. Um, if you're interested in a good case study in understanding the things that govern or might change within a community, I've got two examples up here. Knative recently have gone through quite a few discussions in this space of what that governance model should be, what that who should be on a steering committee, what the scope of that committee should be. And of course, Istio went through um, something similar. The next metric that I'd recommend you thinking about is responsiveness. What does the mailing list look like? What are those pull re uh, requests? What's that feedback cycle for them? Now, and I'm, I'm talking about these metrics, and these are really focused on communities that want to grow, recognizing that not every open source community is in the same state. So this is really focused on those that are desiring a growth in their community and in their space of further development. The next one that's interesting is the contributor activity and count. Uh, within the Kubernetes community, this is kind of broken up into a core, 80% of the contrib contributions are regular, 15% and a casual. And within your own community, it might be interesting to have a look at this breakdown of what does what does those casual committers look like? Are you getting frequency with those casual committers and are you growing and expanding? Um, the next piece there is commit velocity. How active is it? I've got a little graph up the top right that highlights um, Apache Geode and just what, it, what the commit velocity has been for it over the years since it was open sourced. So you can see like active communities are generally more likely to attract growth within them. And then release frequency is a really interesting one, if that makes sense for the project you're working on. Um, quarterly, weekly, monthly, what's that release frequency? And the hope is that it's consistent. That's the intent, so it's predictable. So next up, we've got inclusivity. And this is probably where I'm going to spend a bit more of my time. Like Kim, I really value having um, equity within our communities. And I want to speak to some simple things you can do to help with that. The first one is code of conduct enforcement. So you might have a code of conduct, but are you actually enforcing it? I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that one. Uh, not enforcing it is the same as not having a code of conduct. So the value really is in actually utilizing what you've put together. How do you address difficult contributors? How do you respond when someone's on a mailing list or um, in a forum in some way? And um, that, I think the best way to say it is difficult. I'll leave you to define that further. And then do you have diversity in your leadership? 
Um, different people come with different perspectives and the benefits of having that diversity is it'll leave you open to thinking about the inclusive community that you want and the diverse community that you want to grow. What is the onboarding experience? How hard is it for a new person to join your community? What are the things that you've set up to enable them to join and to um, add value early? And uh, there's a really good link um, I put at the bottom and I'll share it with my slides that actually speaks to these metrics in a more thorough way than I have here on this, on this slide. It actually talks about different considerations you might have as you go through it. How to ensure these are not vanity metrics. Okay, so thinking now, we've got our metrics. We, we sort of understand the value and hopefully you've internalized your own values. Uh, we've got metrics now. Let's actually talk about implementing uh, that inclusivity piece of those metrics. One interesting piece for me as I looked at different communities is there, um, one of the communities that I was involved in um, had this concept around the Apache way. So if we speak about open, which is a concept I'm sure um, most people in this call is familiar with, it's defined as technical decisions are discussed, decided, and archived publicly. In the team that I was involved in, the mantra within the team was, if it didn't happen on the mailing list, it didn't happen. Um, now, this was great because it was definitive and it matched that open definition. But as you, if you read ahead on my slide, as you can see, if, if you think about basic human patterns of behavior and communication strategies and you limit everyone to written form, um, it, ha it can have really negative impacts. And the, the couple of examples I'll give you that I saw play out is there were long email chains that were turning non-constructive. Sometimes with the email, you get into a habit of who can respond the quickest and you feel like the conversation might move on without you. So that can make you perhaps more terse in your response to make sure you're, you get your perspective in. There's no movement to chat in person, call, or at any time. Um, as a result, what started to happen is long-time contributors kind of didn't want to be on the mailing list anymore. And that, that's the real negative. That's starting to sort of really impact your community. I'd say the other way that this could play out is perhaps new contributors are on that mailing list and also seeing that behavior that may impact whether they want to stay. So what might that community do differently? Um, there could be daily or weekly public discussion time. It could be scheduled. And you could say, what are the open issues or topics that we're working through? And use that as an opportunity to discuss things. I think changing that mantra to, if uh, it didn't happen in the public, it didn't happen, might be a better way to think about this. To give a bit more freedom on the how, but still stick to that same desire on the openness. So this is important because how you behave directly impacts who you attract to your community. And if you wanna grow, my hope is that you wanna grow in a way that people feel valued and part of the community and not just grow. And there's a difference between those. Um, it's difficult to really just grow without that first step anyhow. The, there's a great book, Building Successful Online Communities, Evidence-Based Social Design by Robert Kraut and Paul Resnick. And a key takeaway they had was that people sanction misbehaviors because in the long run, uh, doing so improves the welfare of the groups of which they are a part. So by directly um, enforcing your code of conduct, you are improving the welfare of the group that you're part of. By choosing not to enforce or not to engage when there is an issue, you aren't helping the welfare of your group. You aren't helping it potentially grow. You might be dissuading new members from staying. So with this in mind, so we've talked through values, we've talked through metrics, we've talked through inclusivity. I have three key tips for you to consider and, and walk away with. So let's say you've put your metrics in place, um, you've internalized your why, you probably had that done already. Um, what are the three things that you should actually start to do within your community to really create an impact here? Um, now, of course, if you don't have a code of conduct or you haven't reviewed it recently, that would be like the step zero. But I'm going to move on from there and give you a couple more tips. This is really important. Um, if we're talking about growth. It's really critical that you guard the, the time of your core team and maintainers, your contributors. If the core team is spending all of their time 
engaging on newbie questions or PRs that maybe aren't sort of up to a level they need to be. Um, and you haven't sort of introduced some level of support in that model, you're gonna have challenges growing. So plan for how you can scale and support your team. You might have sort of sensed this coming as I talked about code of conduct, but review and establish patterns of behavior for all members, not just the new, not just the existing members. Um, this should happen regularly. This is not a one-time event. Have a look at your last few mailing list conversations or have a look at your last three discussions. How healthy were they? How inclusive were they? What sort of language was used? What sort of terms were discussed? Where are people shot down for having an opinion rather than it being an open discussion? You know, we're not always gonna disagree on everything, but my hope is that we can have civil discussions and debates um, and use proof of concepts to prove out value. And the third one is lower the barrier to entry. Uh, what does that process look like for a new person coming onto the team? How do they get engaged and how do they get started without impacting those that core team members or that contributor? What are those tasks that you're identifying for them to pick up? What's the guide for them to get started? How many steps do they have to go through to actually get involved? Um, the more you lower, it, lower that barrier and, you know, and, and keep good systems in place, the easier it is going to be to grow your community. So that's the three. Guard the time of your core team and maintainers, review and establish patterns of behavior, and lower the barrier to entry. I've put some couple of resources here if you want to learn more. If you think about health metrics, I've got the link in there for uh, that good debate describing them. Two good books um, to consider. You know, there's a bit of history involved. There's a bit of case studies as you go through them. Uh, working in Public, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software by Nadia uh, Egbal, and then Building Successful Online Communities, Evidence-Based Social Design, Robert Kraut and Paul Resnick. Um, and that's really all I had. So welcome any questions or um, can hand it back over. We do have just a few minutes, but I did not see any questions in chat. Um, but uh, hopefully you'll hang around for more of the event and uh, be in our, in our event chat for more questions. Thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Thank you, Rich.